good morning everyone. This is Monica Larner. Good afternoon in Italy and welcome to another um, episode of the Italian wine series. Uh, I'm doing chats with Italian winemakers um, for the foreseeable future every Friday at this time. So I welcome you all. I'm happy to see everybody um, click in. Today we have a fantastic and charming woman, uh, Elisabetta Gepetti of uh, Fattoria Le Pupille uh, in coastal Tuscany. So let's see if we can invite her to come in and get her to join. Um, I really look forward to this, to this hour because Elisabetta is just one of my favorite people in Italian wine. She is, she's got a great personality and she has a terrific approach, hands-on approach to her wines. Um, she is, here they are, Fattori Le Pupile. Let me invite them. Hi, everybody joining. Uh, and as we wait for Elisabetta to join in, as usual, if anybody has any questions. Eccola, good morning. Ciao. Good afternoon, Elisabetta. How are you? Ciao. Happy to see you. Happy to see you. Happy to see you. You look lovely. You, you look you look nice. You look very in, in very great shape. Yeah, very good shape for at nine hair. o'clock in the morning, which I have to say I woke up a little bit late today, so <laughs> But I wish I was in Italy. I wish I was in Italy. This is an awful situation. I, I can imagine. I can imagine. I still remember your wonderful house in Rome. Yes, yes. We'll talk about place that. Of, I will. Place of my heart. <laughs> uh, and you can you can you see me uh, in a proper way? Yes. Put put your but, camera but down I, a little bit so we can see your. Yes, okay. Just one yeah, Put it down a little bit so we can see your. Oh, there you go. Oh. Okay. Yes. Hi. Yes. Uh, my assistant, my personal assistant. Clara. <laughs> <laughs> Ciao, Clara. She's, she's much more familiar than me. Ciao. Do the Zoom, Insta Live, all this modern Hi. social way to communicate. Well, you know, it's been great, one. the social way of communicating, because we've been having a huge success with this series. And it's really fun to see so many people from around the world. Um, and it's great to be able to connect with winemakers and give everybody a chance to kind of uh, talk through their wine philosophy and their territories and their wine styles. So we'll get to all of that. But before I start, Elisabetta, tell us how you've been the last couple of months. Um, how has the lockdown been treating you? And what have you been up to since this uh, terrible uh, pandemic uh, started? It has, been, uh, it has been very, very hard. Even if we are living uh, uh, really in the countryside, so uh, in this way we have been lucky. Uh, we had the possibility to go on with all our work, both in the vineyard and in the cellar. We never had to stop. So uh, I really can say that uh, at the end of the story, uh, it, it has been hard, but much better than... Uh, in many other places, uh, also in Italy, I mean, in the cities, in the big mm. cities. Uh, uh, and so then it, uh, what uh, I have to say is that um, Italy, since the very beginning, took, uh, I mean, uh, the government took a quite strong uh, decision and uh, the country was really locked down. And so this was quite helpful for developing the developing of the problem in a, in a, in a good way. Uh, at the moment, uh, we are quite safe uh, and uh, business has uh, started uh, since the beginning of June. Uh, uh, restaurants and uh, some hotels are reopened. And now, especially here on the Tuscan coast, uh, we have uh, some nice tourists coming from Europe. So we are, we are happy. And if I think uh, about the situation in the U.S., I, I really feel, uh, uh, feel sad. Uh, we have a lot of people living there. You, uh, <laughs> it, it's, it's hard. There it's really terrible. Yeah, it's been, it's been really difficult. I, I, you know, watched the whole lockdown um, from here. And it was just shocking, the idea that you had to, you know, write up a permit if you wanted to go down and take your dog for a walk um, and, you know, to, to go to the supermarket, everything. It's been different here, so. 
anyway. <laughs> no comment, right? No comment. <laughs> no, no comment. Anyway, so um, listen, so tell us a little bit, Elizabeth, about where you are. You're on the Tuscan coast, but you're also close to Scansano, which is a, another wine region. Um, based on Sangiovese with other grapes, but you have a more kind of flexible approach from your positioning near Grosseto on the Tuscan coast. And kind of give us an idea of your territory, of what, um, of what it looks like. Uh, it's more kind of, it's more sparsely populated. It's a beautiful area of Tuscany, uh, very rural, rolling hills, lots of bright luminosity and sunshine near the near the Tyrrhenian Sea, so a lot of luminosity. And give us a little bit more, more uh, character of where you are exactly. You are, you are describing the area in uh, such a wonderful way. Maybe I love it, yeah. Than me, maybe better than me, and I feel that you love Maremma. This is the, the south part of the Maremma. The coast is the same coast than Bulgaria, more on the south. And the winery uh, is located not far from Grosseto town. Uh, vineyards, most of the vineyards are more inside in a very hilly area. Uh, the nearest village to the heart of the vineyard is Pereta. Pereta is a medieval village in the middle, in the heart of the Morellino denomination. It's uh, between Scanzano that gives the name to the nomination and Magliano in Toscana. Uh, I remember I made you visiting Magliano many years ago while you were uh, having a different collaboration uh, with another... Uh, with my previous medicine. employer. Many years ago, we were, we were very young, very young. <laughs> but you know, um, uh, you know as, a, as, a, as someone who considers Rome her adopted home, you know, that part of Tuscany is just a few hours drive from the city. And it's where, even when I was a kid, when I went to high school in Italy, that was always where we would go. It's really a huge part of my, of my, yeah, my for, time for in Italy, people, my upbringing. For Roman it's beautiful. people, it's the place to go, uh, to go on holiday during summertime, uh, uh, even during uh, all the weekends, because it's quite close to Rome. Exactly. So it's, uh, it's between Rome and, uh, and Siena, Florence, and the hills of the internal Tuscany. Uh, the, the winery is, uh, is a family business. I started to run up the company uh, quite young, in 85. Uh, at the beginning, it was like, uh, like an hobby for the family, because uh, it was the traditional uh, Tuscany farm where they were producing many things and they were also growing grapes but the small production of wine uh, was more for family and friends than to to sell it then my father-in-law uh, started to make the first bottles it was a simple vino da tavola it was vino da tavola from Pereta. and then in the 78 when the denomination morellino di scanzano started uh, on the market we have been between the first first wineries maybe together with the cantina cooperativa at that time to produce this wine but my my wine of the art you know is uh, is Sofredi that has been uh, really my first wine I only have More I have a I have a barrel sample so this is not the finished <laughs> label <Have a> <laughs> and, and then you you have it thank you that's better <laughs> here it's okay but no, you have to up, to up a little bit, bottom. up a little bit, yeah. yeah. There you go, yeah. <laughs> it's difficult for me. My assistant left me. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can see that. We can see that. We can see a little bit of the of that. So, because Safredi is your is your kind of iconic wine at the at the yeah. uh, today it's you know the the wine that kind of most represents. Fattoria Le Pupile, but you have a, a large range of other wines and very interesting wines as well. Um, you work now with winemaker Luca da Toma, who is uh, kind of a, a very precise, I guess is a word, very precise, very um, hardworking, very precise. Very precise right? <laughs> there are other words I'm sure they could be used, but precise is definitely one of them. And he, um, he you, how long have you been working with Luca now? Uh, nine, years, nine years. Nine years. When I started okay. in '85, I had the great chance to collaborate for a quite long period with Giacomo Takis. He was a good friend of my father-in-law, 
And Giacomo has been uh, really my, my mentor because he teached teach me everything. Right, of course. Okay. Yeah, the, the, the I was, stylistic. Uh, I was only 20 years old, so you can imagine uh, how it was for me, how it has been for me to, to stay close to such a big uh, person because it was already uh, most. Uh, and his acknowledgement uh, uh, about not only wine, but about uh, the culture uh, of wine was terrific. He was studying a lot uh, from all the traditions. I mean, tradition coming from uh, ancient Greece, from uh, the Etruski. And this was so very interesting and so very unique, uh, especially if I make a comparison with all the other uh, winemaker consulting that I had during uh, my career. A very special person. Did you have the chance to meet him? You know, I never met Giacomo Takis, and I, uh, you know, obviously he's a figure that is larger than life when you taste his wines, you know, and and the the thread that links them all, you know, this, uh, you know, this incredible sense of Italianita, you know, this, this sense of uh, of wines that can only be made in certain territories really starts with with his philosophy going back to you know uh, 40 years ago and and whatnot of course Giacomo Takis is the man behind many of the wines from the Antinori family and uh, Tinuto Sanguido and in the north San Leonardo I mean his he's he's an incredible figure for for Italian wine and incredible. much of even your philosophy then at Fattorilla Pupile starts with this imprint this important um... it's been a great a great imprinting uh, for the winery and also for my uh, wine philosophy for my wine philosophy I have to say this absolutely absolutely and also the uh, the idea uh, about producing a new wine in 85 that became Sarfedi also this idea in a way uh, I, I don't want to say that it was becoming from him because it was becoming uh, from me, but he was trusting me and pushing me to start this new adventure with a new wine that uh, has to be for some years 100% Cabernet Sauvignon and to plant a new vineyard to dedicate this vineyard to this wine. Uh, you know, when you are very young with no with a, a few experience, uh, you need to, to have somebody that is trusting you uh, and uh, pushing you to also to, to trust yourself uh, and to put all your effort to be successful in an adventure. Because for me, it has been really an adventure. If I think about those years. But, you know, it, it brings an interesting question because where you are located is not necessarily um, a, a recognized wine region. You're kind of one estate, you know, um, far away from, you know, the other estates in Bulgari or in other parts of Tuscany. So in a sense, you had to come out with this strong identity from the very beginning for an estate like yours. No, because Fatrile Popile very much defines an excellence in, um, in a spot that, that has fewer uh, peers, let's say, or fewer neighbors. You're right, you're right. Especially if I think about the 80s, uh, the area, the Mare Magrestetana was completely, completely unknown. Um, the Morellino denomination uh, at that time was quite recent. And so, uh, frankly speaking, it has been a, quite a hard work to travel all through the world to promote the area uh, because it was uh, almost unknown. I mean, it was an area with a, an important uh, tradition in growing grapes, but uh, until the end of the 80s, especially with the, our work and, of course, the work of from some other important wineries, but until that time, uh, the area was uh, quite unknown as a area of wine production. It was, it was known more for the grapes. Mm -mm -mm. Then, with the, in the 90s, it became slowly, quite slowly, a little bit more uh, successful, if I can use these words. 
And at the end of the 90s, at the beginning of 2000, a lot of uh, uh, wineries uh, that were producing uh, important brands in other Italian regions became to decided to, to make important investments in the area. And so we can say, we can easily say that uh, the Maremma Grossetana started to become uh, a little bit more known, I don't want to say famous, uh, a little bit more known uh, from the 2000s. Do you agree? Yeah. yeah, no, in fact, I'm seeing comments just to make clear, you know, obviously, we were talking about what, back then, but today, it is very well known, obviously, and there is a big group of dynamic producers from the area. So a lot has changed. And that's what makes, um, you know, uh, this part of Marema so exciting, because it's been there's been such dynamic growth. But there's also creativity there. And that's the point that I want to get at, um, that, you know, outside some of the stricter appellations, a wine like Safredi um, can can thrive and has such a unique identity, you know, uh, with with, sure. you know, the influence of someone like Takis at the at the it's like having a, a open you know, open plate and open, you know, uh, canvas to paint on, you know, and that's what I find very exciting about, about your, about your estate. Um, and I also want to say that, Elisabetta, you are so hands-on. I mean, I remember visiting you um, a couple of years ago and you were, it was, you know, just soon after harvest and there you were watching your Syrah grapes fermenting in Amphora. It was 2015, five years ago. That was in 15, ago. yeah. So it's five more than that, five years ago. <laughs> five years ago. Time goes by. So tell us a little bit about some of the newer projects that you've added on, because there have been quite a few newer wines added to your portfolio um, in recent years, like I the remember, Syrah. I remember very well the, 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 the year just because of the Syrah. It was first vintage for our Syrah, Le Pupille. 2015. It's a, it's a very nice project that I developed together with the team at, at the winery. Uh, grapes are coming from two different vineyards. One in the hill just behind the, the cellar, uh, Bozzino. It's, a, it's one of the vineyards coming from Il Bozzino, Vigna del Palo. And the other one, very small one, uh, lesser than one hectare planted in the 2000, the nearby Pereta, Pian di Fiora. And the grapes coming from these two different vineyards, uh, they are uh, vinificated separately in two different, completely two different ways. Uh, the one from Pereta makes the fermentation in the Orci Toscani. The orchard was sure. the, the, like the, amphora, yeah. but it's the Tuscan name for an, an orchard. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's different from uh, yeah, they're they're from, bigger from, and from amphora. it's a little bit different, especially uh, because of the the material. I mean, the terracotta from orchi is typically uh, from the mm -hmm. soil of the Chianti area, and our orchi are very special because they are very they are made. From the an, an important uh, Italian uh, family of producing wine, the Manetti family. Uh, so part of the of the wine uh, makes the fermentation in the orchi, and the rest, uh, together with the um, with the grapes, one third of the total volumes it's uh, unseparated, and the rest it makes fermentation in open tonneau. Then after we make the blend and we age the wine uh, in, in big tonneau, 300 liters tonneau, uh, not for a very long time, but it's very, uh, it's changing every year. It's changing every year, of course, following the different, uh, uh, the different. Um, the vintages. From, or the... Yeah, so, sorry, from the vintages. <laughs> I mean, from the so oh, tell yeah. us, how did you start? Because, you know, the using the Orcho, um, you know, from either the Manetti family or other people that make them is something that we're seeing. Uh, it's, it's, a more, it's a common, not, not common, it's not common at all, but it's, we're seeing more of it. Now it's becoming more, more, uh, more, I've seen uh, a lot of wineries that uh, in the last five, he has uh, started this kind of uh, this kind of project uh, yeah. in Tuscany, in Orcho, and then uh, Amphora, Amphora, Amphora. With, also with a different uh, with a different shape, 
Uh, we also introduced after two years, uh, uh, following the idea of the wine, the winemaker co consulting Luca, we, we introduced uh, a different uh, uh, a, a traditional amphora, but it's a, it's a very big one, and the material is different because it's a cocho pesto, cocho pesto. <clears throat> we uh, vinificated the grapes, uh, the Syrah grapes in the Cocho Pesto, if I remember well, uh, starting uh, from uh, 2018. So uh, we, have to, we have to see, we have to wait. I mean, uh, it's something that is changing every year, uh, making experiments to figure out uh, the, the best way. The idea is to have a Syrah, uh, uh, a, a Syrah that is going toward elegance, not such a powerful Syrah how you can easily find, especially uh, on the Tuscan coast and on the south part of Tuscany. We, we really wish to, to have more, um, a wine more with more elegance uh, and to follow some great Syrah coming from the Côte du Rhône. But have you, I mean, it was the, the use of these um, clay, so Cocho Pesto was earthenware. I'm not sure how else to, to translate it. Um, but I mean, yeah. It's also so the, possible, Cocho Pesto. I just looked it up. It says earthenware pesto. I'm not even sure what that means in English. So I'm just going to go with earthenware. Pasta, pasta pesto. <laughs> <laughs> So, but it was, it was Luca, da Toma that kind of, was, was he the first to get you interested or were you already curious with experimenting with this new vessel, with this other, this alternative vessel before? But frankly speaking, the idea of the Orcho, the idea of the Orcho was coming from my daughter. Ah, okay. She's a great friend of the guys uh, from the Manetti family and uh, during 2000, 13, 14, she was visiting uh, uh, with Federico Manetti, she was visiting not, not only his winery and trying the wine vinificated in the orchard, but also some other, uh, some other wineries where young generation was, uh, were making experiments with this kind of, uh, how, how can we call in another way than orchard? Uh, I use in my orcho. reviews. I use the word orcho because orcho. I, I figured I, I might as well use the Italian word, or I'll say a Tuscan version of an amphora. But it is a different. It's a it's a larger vessel, and also completely uh, in full disclosure, my brother is a winemaker. He just bought his first Manetti orcho, and oh, we're really? waiting for it. Yes, we're waiting oh, for it to arrive so nice in September. So I think it's the people even in California are using them. But it's, there's, they're made out of a clay from Impruneta in, in Tuscany. And it has, you know, a certain, a yeah, certain, certain density and thickness mm -hmm. uh, that, you know, that allows for measured transpiration of oxygen. So they're considered ideal for, for winemaking. And we've, we've seen quite a few of them. It's been quite an exciting development in Italian wine. And in fact, I just saw a question that somebody asked about what in your uh, view is the difference between um, a your Syrah or a Tuscan Syrah from, you know, uh, a Cote de Rhone Syrah or a Syrah from, from, of course, from the Rhone? Of course, the terroir is completely different, you know. Uh, uh, this makes the big difference. Uh, even if you follow a, a pr philosophy production more towards the, the north, I mean, the, the wines from... Uh, Duron. Yeah, the climate is different. Uh, also, the, the 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 light is very very different in uh, in Maremma. At the beginning of your introduction, you were talking about Maremma, and you you were telling people listening to us that it's a, a, an area with a very special light, and this is absolutely true. The light uh, that we are here. Uh, is reflecting on uh, on the grapes, and we have to be very careful in the managing of the vineyard. Especially, we have to be very careful uh, 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 and put a lot of attention at the moment of the of the harvest, trying not to have never have overripeness 
all the ripened grapes and have a good uh, man management of the of the leaves uh, so it's uh, it's uh, it's a good uh, it's a great it's a great work that we have to make uh, especially in the vineyard you know uh, i see that yeah. um you know max of uh, of, of montepulciano avignonese he's following us and he's telling us that orcho is from the latin uh it's a latin word so we have uh, <laughs> An expert Latin way, words. yes, Orchus, I think he said, yeah. And I also saw that uh, Luca. Ciao, Max. Ciao, my uncle. And I saw Luca Corrado Vietti was following us and some other winemakers as well. <laughs> Just winemakers. <laughs> no, we have. <laughs> they're curious. <laughs> yeah, they're very curious. <laughs> Listen, I have, okay, so uh, there's some questions here. We have a question. First of all, somebody keeps asking, if the Instagram live will be posted on our website and it will be posted, but usually that happens on Monday because our team in Singapore will download what we've recorded and you'll, you can see it on our website, on the Instagram page on, on Monday. And then, um, oh yes, here's, I see some more, I see some more definitions of, uh, thank you everybody for being, yeah, Cocho Pesco is a modern Italian building material used in ancient Rome, made of tiles broken up into small pieces, mixed with mortar, uh, beaten down with a hammer. There you go, Cocho Pesto. <laughs> Cocho Pesto. But I also, uh, anyway, we, I have orcho, a question. Orcho, the Orcho, uh, it was not our, of course, but uh, the traditional Orcho is for olive oil, not for wine. Yes, in fact, in fact. Well, no, the, the traditional one. No, I, I was specifying my system is blaming me. <laughs> <laughs> in the past, in the past, of course, in the past. <laughs> Listen, we have a question also, um, changing subject a little bit, about global warming. Have you seen any effects of global warming in your part of Tuscany? Yes, of course. Of course, uh, the, the the harvest. If I, if I think about uh, harvesting uh, thirty more than thirty years ago when I started, it was completely different. Uh, we started to to pick the white grapes uh, generally in September, the first days of September. Now, uh, since uh, or more than ten years. Uh, we started to pick the Tramina grapes for Poggio Argentato. It is our white uh, wine, our IGT. Generally, we start in the third, weeks, uh, third week of August. So, mm. of course, the climate has changed a lot. Uh, this is a, a great challenge for us because we have to find out new solution uh, for our vineyard. Uh, we started to make uh, some years ago. We started with we started to to cut, and we started to make the acapanamento for the vineyard in a way to protect uh, the grapes uh, if there is a very special warm summer time. Uh, and then we also made in almost our vineyard. We uh, uh, arranged the water irrigation system because sometimes you need to make uh, one or twice uh, to, uh, irrigation to, to the vines. So I have to say that uh, climate, uh, unfortunately, has changed a lot uh, in the last uh, 15 years uh, for sure and maybe also maybe also more maybe also more what mm -hmm. I realized during this lockdown uh, uh, I, I realized that uh, uh, summertime I don't know if it it has been by chance but this summertime was remembering me more the summertime than I was a child I mean it's uh, it's it's very warm. It's hot now. It's hot, but we had some storm, and then just after the storm, the sun was coming out uh, again, and it it was sunny. It was shining, and this was very was happening uh, very easily when I was a child. And then while I was growing, ah! sorry, <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the the telephone. Sorry. 
uh, when I was uh, growing up and getting older, unfortunately, summer was changing a lot as winter and the other season uh, were, do were doing. But so just... during the lockdown, something has changed for me. Less pollution, no flights, also the world. Uh, maybe we have to think about uh, all the, the things that uh, happened, recently happened. Yeah, it's time for, 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 for reflection, for sure. So you mentioned your, your white wine, um, the Poggio Argentato, which is a blend. You said it's, it's mostly Sauvignon Blanc. With uh, uh, and Petit Mansin. And a little and bit of Petit Mansin. Very small amount of Sauvignon, but very, very few grapes. Mm -hmm. Basically, it's a 60 Sauvignon Blanc, uh, 10 uh, Traminer, uh, 20 Petit Mansin, and the rest is Sauvignon. It's changing mm -hmm. also following the different vintages and, and uh, how grapes uh, are when we make the harvest. So what is this vintage looking like? When do you expect? We're almost there at the third week of August. How is it looking now? I, I think that we are going to, to start the harvest maybe in 10 days, thinking mm. about the Traminer. Mm, I think so, especially because uh, the last 10 days, uh, the temperature were quite, uh, quite important during the day. Fortunately, there was a very nice range temperature, uh, important excursion of temperature between uh, uh, days and nights, but uh, the second half of, of July was quite, uh, quite hot. Um, it's, for the moment, it seems to be a nice, a nice harvest, but uh, if uh, I, I can talk about the white grapes because the red, we still have to wait a lot. So you never know. Uh, personally, every, every summer time, I feel very, um, I'm always worrying a lot for the hail because, uh, you know, if there is a storm coming uh, and then temperature goes down uh, quickly, then you, ha you can have the hail. And this is uh, terrifying me every year. So it's like a nightmare. Mm. It, no, but are you, are you getting, do you think you're getting more hail? Is it, are you getting more? Is it more common? I'm losing, I'm losing a little bit the connection. No. no. Okay. Perfect. No, I was asking Elisabetta if you, are you seeing more hail? Is that one of the changes you're seeing? Okay. Absolutely, see. yes. Absolutely, Absolutely yes. You are, uh, you're right. So. Until, uh, until the, the beginning of the 90s, uh, it was a right, uh, it was a rare to have the ale. Uh, and, and then this, uh, this problem was growing uh, all through Italy, all through Italy, all through France. Uh, yeah. And, and the same has been for the, uh, the, Oh, sorry, I can't remember. La, le ghiacciate, the, um, uh, the ghiacciate uh, frost, the or, yeah, frost, the frost, events, sorry, frost, the frost, yeah. the frost. Yeah, I also know that. I mean, at the end of even at the end of August in Rome, you get these, you know, these these awful, um, you know, like bomba d'acqua, you know, huge water bomb hailstorms, strange weather phenomenon that I never remember seeing, you know, ten years mm -hmm. ago. Elizabeth, we have a question about the, um, for your white wine. Was it inspired by white Bordeaux? Um, at the beginning, uh, at the beginning, yes, of course. Uh, because of, uh, after the collaboration with uh, Giacomo Takis, uh, I spent um, almost 10 years to, to work together with a French winemaker. And uh, he suggested uh, us to plant uh, the at the end of the nineties. He suggested us to plant the Petit Mansin. We, so <clears throat> we add the Petit Mansin to the Poggio Argentato blend, and the wine changed a lot. Um, the acidity uh, that the Petit Mansin uh, uh, is giving to the wine. Uh, was uh, helping to create uh, a, a 
quite uh, a, a vertical, a vertical uh, wine uh, with a lot of freshness uh, that is very well combined together with the aromas and the sweetness coming from the from Miner and the Sauvignon Blanc. So Christian for me has been the one that uh, uh, changed our our until uh, a few few times ago our unique white wine because you tasted just you you tasted the, uh, the PM PM do you remember PM I remember very well I remember we went we were in the you were in the winery and you said come back here and there were some you know barrels at the back of the winery kind of barrels, put off to the barrels. side two barrels exactly two barrels. Apart from the rest, uh, not, uh, not every vintage, not every vintage. Just in the in the best vintages, uh, we we produce the the PM that is a hundred percent And how many how many yes. so how many vintages do you have of it then? Me. Uh, we started 14, 15. 14, 15. Uh, 14, 15. 14, It was just an experiment. Uh, it's uh, one to know. Fifteen two to know. And 15, we started to release the wine on the market with a nice success, even if it's a very small production, of course. And then from, uh, from 16, 18, and 19, it's, uh, it's still uh, in the tonneau. It's still 18, uh, we, bottled, uh, we bottled it, uh, uh, if I remember right, it was springtime. Oh, no, maybe, yeah, springtime, springtime. And you also make a rosé, which is made with Syrah, which is very, you know, kind of summery and fresh. Um, so that, you know, That's so you have a rosé. And then in your, in your red wines, um, I mean, with, there are quite a few, but one of them that always stands out is the Poggio Valente, which is a beautiful wine and really... Poggio Valente, uh, it's uh, our, uh, our second uh, single vineyard, 100% Sangiovese. Uh, it used to be uh, Morellino di Scansano until vintage uh, uh, for 14. We, if I, we change it, uh, put it out from the denomination with vintage 14. Uh, and uh, it, it was a challenge for the, in my mind, for, for the Morellino. Yeah, yeah, okay, I don't was, have the final bottle, but this is the, this is the, this is the campione from the vat, so you can't vat. look at the label. <laughs> 18, 18 vintage. 18, It's a yeah. wine that changes a lot uh, all through the different vintages because at the beginning uh, it was Morellino, Iscanzano, single vineyard, the Reserva, and it was mainly Sangiovese but with a small uh, percentage of Alicante. Then we replace the Alicante. Alicante is very traditional in the Marema area, Marema Grossetana, uh, because it, it, uh, it came uh, through the area during the 16th century. We had important uh, um, historical moment on the coast uh, with Spanish domination. It was called the Stato dei Presidi. And so uh, the um, people studying viticulture in the area told me, people from Pisa University told me many years ago that uh, the, the, the very special clone of uh, Alicante that we have in, in the Maremma is coming from that uh, uh, historical moment. And it, uh, it makes part uh, also of the um, traditional uh, Morellino blend. So uh, when I was young uh, and I started the adventure with Poggio Valente, uh, I decided also to keep it in the blend for some years. Then I replaced it with Merlot. And then uh, with Vintage 12, uh, together with the team, we wanted to to work a lot on the Sangiovese to find out the best uh, that we could do, and the, the, we decided to have 100% Sangiovese. And we also changed it in the same vintage uh, club. We changed the the way to uh, to age the wine uh, in the barrels uh, with the introduction at the beginning with with the big casks. Uh, 
20 and 10 hectoliters. And then uh, the uh, vintage after 13, uh, we introduce uh, the big tonneau, uh, 600 liters ton tonneau and uh, 10 hectoliters uh, casks. And then starting from uh, uh, 15 only tonneau, 500 and 600 liters tonneau. 50% uh, is new and the second half is second, uh, second end. So there's calibre. been a, a, a change in the aging, the oak aging regime and the philosophy kind of going from smaller containers to bigger containers um, and using a little bit more neutral neutral wood. At the moment, uh, at the moment uh, uh, we are using uh, uh, the traditional uh, small French oak barrels just for Safredi because for, uh, for the Valente, for the Valente uh, is a big to know. Reserva is uh, Morino is consuming Reserva. We are producing uh, uh, some uh, nice Reserva. We tasted uh, almost uh, every vintage. And Reserva is uh, coming from the big cask, 40, 40 hectoliters. And this, uh, this also has been uh, um, uh, the, the introduction of the big casks. Uh, uh, has helped a lot the Reserva, uh, giving us the, the possibility to produce a wine with a more important fruit, uh, less aggressive, uh, less aggressive wood, and a wine more pleasant for for people on the market, basically. You know, the, the dis dis decision to make Poggio Valente 100% Sangiovese was quite courageous. And it also, um, you know, gives us a chance to taste the pure expression of Sangiovese from your territory at a time when obviously we are familiar with Sangiovese from other parts of Tuscany, from Montalcino, from, uh, from Chianti Classico. And so it's, it's uh, I've always, I mean, it's a, it's a courageous but important decision because um, there are not that many great Sangioveses from the coast of Tuscany. In fact, the coast of Tuscany hasn't right. often been associated with Sangiovese. So it's always a wine that I appreciate very much to taste because it gives me kind of parameters of the versatility and the, you know, expanse of Sangiovese's limits and possibilities. So it's, you um... <laughs> You're right. Uh, you are, uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, it's, uh, it's a big challenge for, for the winery for Giovalente. At the moment, uh, frankly speaking, it's the challenge uh, especially because it's not uh, it's not easy uh, to to make people understand a wine like Poggio Because if you think about the great Sangiovese in Tuscany, you think especially about Brunello. Am I right? Or also Chianti, but uh, in uh, yeah, Brunello, yeah, Brunello, Brunello is Brunello. And so the, the, the comparison for us uh, uh, is, uh, is important. That's why I'm telling you that it's at uh, the moment, it's uh, the challenge, uh, the Porto Valente. And uh, we are really uh, putting a lot of effort uh, and we are very focused on this wine. Uh, what I think regarding uh, Porto Valente, even if it's not easy to talk about our wine, no? It's like uh, it's like your your <laughs> children. I mean, it's not easy to, to be uh, to to have a, a, a critic attitude to be critic. But uh, for, in, in my opinion, uh, we have to make one more effort and keep the wine more in the bottle before releasing it on the mar release it on the market, and then before making taste to journalists. <laughs> Because it, it, the wine needs really to to rest a lot in the bottle, Poggio Valente. Uh, if I taste now uh, the thirteen, that has, has been uh, had been quite well rated. But uh, I remember when we we tasted it, uh, uh, the wine was not expressing. Uh, all the, 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 the things and his proper sound that is expressing now. So the, now the, the challenge is to, to keep it in the bottle and to make it uh, have a nice evolution mm -hmm. in, our, in our cellar. I yes. hope to be able, I hope to be able. <laughs>
Well, you're coming out now with the, so the 18 Safredi and the 2018 Poggio Valente, when will they be released on the market? Um, 18 uh, Safredi, the next, uh, next four. And may, oh. maybe Poggio Valente, maybe the beginning of the, of, of the next year. Because mm -hmm. we have to, to respect some contract that, that we have with the uh, importers. The decision, it's something that it's gonna starting uh, uh, with the programs for next year. And we have a question, when is the best time to drink the 2014? 14? Uh, Poggio Valente is already. I think the question is for, for, Poggio, for Poggio Valente, but I'm not sure if you, yeah. 14 has been uh, uh, as considered uh, mm, as a small vintage, but generally in, uh, in Pupille, uh, generally we, we are able to, to make nice wine, especially in the small vintages. <laughs> <laughs> no. 14, I think that you can drink, easily drink it right now, but you can, of course, uh, wait for me as uh, just because it was not the big that big vintage, uh, you can enjoy a, a nice glass of uh, Poggio Valente. Mm, it's 13, uh, if you wait, it's, uh, it's bad. Uh, as uh, right. 15 and 16, of course, the same. Especially 15, because 15 was such a powerful uh, uh, vintage all through Tuscan coast. And yeah, it should be we, interesting. Yeah, it's in a way, it's... reflecting and reflecting... Uh, uh, the 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 characteristics characteristic of the Tuscan coast. And I was going to say that you know Sangiovese also has a tendency to kind of put on more weight and volume with time. So I could see you know thirteen already had a lot of concentration and it was a you know a wine with um, broader shoulders and whatnot. So it, you know it has the the aging potential. Fourteen is a little bit um, more streamlined, perhaps, but. You know, I think that, yeah, that it's definitely a wine that which should be fascinating to try it in like five years to see uh, where, where it goes. Evolution. Yeah, evolution. the evolution. Sure. Sure. So let's talk a little bit about Safredi, the, uh, you know, the, the wine that's kind of iconic, uh, not only for your estate, but for Italian wine in general, one of the most important, for sure, um, you know, blended a Tuscan uh, uh, reds. I don't like to use the word super Tuscan, but it definitely would fall into that category. Um, but it's more than that because it's a wine from Maremma. So, you know, tell us a little bit about the stylistic changes of Safredi over the years and where it has come to today. And what changes have you made kind of to the winemaking um, to create with the Safredi? Vintage, uh, with Vintage 17 that we uh, are selling uh, at the moment on the market, Safredi had his uh, 30th anniversary, so a very important anniversary. Uh, we had a nice uh, uh, vertical tasting uh, presenting the 30, the 30 vintage uh, last fall in London. It was very successful. And uh, for, for me and my family, my daughter and my son also were there. It was very emotional. Uh, super task and it's not uh, the, the, proper, the proper word but it's how uh, most of the people call uh, this wine has been one of the first uh, at the beginning it was 100% Cabernet Sauvignon as I was telling you when we started the, the live on Instagram uh, and then um, we planned it together with the uh, the idea of producing a new wine in 85. We also planted a new vineyard, uh, completely, entirely dedicated to this wine. And the vineyard uh, was uh, divided between Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot and Alicante. And starting from vintage uh, 1990, uh, we uh, also started to add a small percentage growing every vintage coming from the new plantation. Uh, and we arrived uh, in uh, 95 
uh, that uh, Sarfredi with Vintage 95, Sarfredi was uh, coming uh, almost from, not only, not almost, but uh, um, a big part was coming from the, from the new plantation, so the, the, ideal, the ideal vineyard. Uh, then uh, th uh, through the years, uh, uh, of course, uh, with uh, the, the, uh, we I understood uh, things uh, regarding the wine, the the blend, uh, uh, how to age the wine, and so on. Uh, the, the, we made some important some important uh, changement changes, uh, especially uh, regarding the blend, uh, Alicante, uh, we left it away and we replaced it uh, with the Merlot until 2006. 2006 uh, until 2006 it was Alicante and then Merlot and then from 2012, uh, no Merlot, Syrah, sorry Syrah, and then uh, uh, starting with vintage uh, 2012, the the blend became uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, and uh, the Syrah was replaced with uh, Petit Verdot. Uh, Elisabetta, you're getting a lot of compliments on Sanfredi. I'm looking at the at the comments, and everybody, is, <laughs> it's a fantastic really? wine. A lot of people are complimenting you on the 2017. Uh, vintage, and there was a question uh, about what are your favorite vintages of Safredi? Many. <laughs> many <laughs> In many 30 years, vintages. right? There are quite a few. <laughs> many different vintages. Uh, um, 17, 17, um, I enjoyed it a lot. Uh, 16, 16, 13. 10, 10 uh, was such a uh, trope. Somebody's telling me too many, too many. <laughs> but, you know, so baby is my child, is the love of my life. Really. Well, those are all every 16. Time, every time that I have to talk about this wine, I get a little bit emotional. I don't know why. I don't know. Maybe because it, in a way, it's uh, the story of Safedi, in a way, it's the story of my life. The idea uh, started together with my uh, my challenge enjoying uh, Le Pupille Company in '85. For the first time, I managed the harvest uh, alone, and for the first time, I was picking the Cabernet Sauvignon grapes coming from this old Sangiovese vineyard that my father-in-law had decided to graft with the Cabernet Sauvignon but not to make a Cabernet Sauvignon in pureness, but just to uh, combine it together with the, um, with the Sangiovese uh, to uh, elevate, in a way, the unique wine that Pupile was producing at that time, that it was Morino Riserva. The idea to, to have another wine that then became Safedi, 100% Cabernet Sauvignon, was coming from me and Giacomo, uh, after uh, 85 uh, harvest uh, and just because that year uh, my father-in-law he has passed away unfortunately I wanted to uh, dedicate uh, the wine to him uh, his name was Alfredo everybody uh, used to call him Alfredi and that's uh, the name the reason of the name uh, Alfredi and, and this was uh, more or less, uh, more or less uh, the story, more or less the story of this wine that uh, really, um, uh, it makes part uh, of my life. Well, it's a beautiful wine and, you know, coming from a beautiful part of Tuscany, uh, a very special part of Tuscany, and from a fantastic estate that it's always been, you know, it's a pleasure to every year to taste your wines and see the changes. And you always have something exciting to announce, which I always love that, you know, you're uh, a winemaker, a wine family in, in you know, di dynamic motion and forward thinking and looking, you know, how we can change things or, or, or not necessarily improve, but just to change, you know, to kind of make wines that reflect new emotions and new, new thoughts. 
And I still um, remember when I I made the, uh, a, spe a very special flight. I was very young, and then made a very special flight to Baltimore to make uh, uh, Robert uh, taste the wine. It was vintage nineteen no, It was vintage nineteen ninety, and and I was presenting him the wine in uh, maybe ninety in ninety four. In right, that. I remember you told well, me this so story. Yeah. I still remember. <laughs> at that time, it was something very, very unique, and it was not at all easy to approach such a, such a situation. There were a few producer, uh, uh, Italian producer, of course, that who could have the possibility to to make a a special tasting with Mr. Parker. And yeah, I still, have to, I still have to say thank you to my great friend for this, uh, for having arranged this tasting. It is uh, Leonardo Locascio. Those were those were historic <laughs> tastings, and you know, and Bob Bob still talks about them as well. You know, I mean, and I mean, obviously, it must it must have been a walk to only be a fly on the wall. But I know that you you re met Bob again a couple of years ago in London, and it was kind yeah, of yeah. funny too. <laughs> incredible, incredible. We he were... was so lovely with me. He was preparing me a, a very nice box with a lot of uh, incredible good things to eat during my flight back to Rome. Yeah. I loved it. <laughs> Uh, a takeaway goodie box so you would he wouldn't be hungry on the plane no he's a he's a fantastic man very generous and he's fantastic. nothing like you might expect when you meet him because he's so down to earth and genuinely just fun to be with and 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 terrific and i will tell another story because i just love it last year uh elisabetta came to my house in rome to present her wines with luca da toma um the winemaker and he was bringing other samples from his portfolio and he consults with a lot of uh, estates. So we, they came to my apartment with huge, a huge, huge amounts of wine coming out of the car. And we, we tasted it all day long. It was an incredible tasting. And I will never forget at the end of the day, when you walk down to the car, um, somebody had left a little note on the car saying, I saw you, you were, you were such a beautiful woman. Here is my phone number. Because <laughs> you had made oh, such an so impression funny. on so my funny. street in Rome that somebody left so a message funny. saying, I saw you walking on the streets. <laughs> <laughs> with all the boxes, uh, with the bottles. <laughs> Such this beautiful time. woman such with all this wine. Day. Such an incredible day. <laughs> such an incredible day, really, really. Right. It was hilarious. It was very, very funny. <laughs> Only a very funny. <laughs> very funny. You lit up the you lit up the whole street. You lit up the whole, you know, Centro Storico or Rome because <laughs> nobody had seen this kind of, you know, this like goddess like vision of this woman with all these wines. <laughs> <laughs> it's fantastic. fantastic. Listen, Elizabeth, we're at the at the end of the hour, and I just want to thank you so much for sharing this thank time you. with you. It's a pleasure. Yeah, and um, and congratulations again on such beautiful wines and such a beautiful history. You know, bringing so much you know wine culture to that part of uh, of Marema. It is fantastic. It's a true pillar you, lighthouse Marema. on coastal Tuscany. <laughs> Thank you so much. You have been very kind, and I really hope to to see you in Rome. In yes, Rome. I hope so too. I hope so in too. Rome. Soon, soon, I, soon. I think I think you're you're missing uh, Rome. And very Italy. much so. Very are, much. I feel Italian. it's such a strange feeling to not be able to 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 travel. You know, it's incredibly strange. Strange. Incredibly strange. Grazie a tutti. Thanks, everybody. Thank and you, everybody. Follow. Thank you, everybody, for, for, for following. And see you next week. And again, grazie, Elisabetta. Grazie, Monica. Un saluto a tutti quelli che ci hanno seguito. Ciao. Ciao, grazie. Bye. Ciao, ciao. Bye. Bye.